thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me well? So um, the reason we scheduled this talk for today is because Rare Disease Day is coming up tomorrow. So Rare Disease Day is a global movement uh, to raise awareness about rare disease. Because rare disease is actually not a small problem, it's a very common and big problem. So welcome, thank you for coming. So when I met my husband, uh, we pretty soon figured out this is going to be it. And so we started talking about um, our vision for a family. Um, he is from a family with three kids, I'm from a family with two, so we decided we'll aim for a two and a half kids, a house, a dog maybe, or maybe not, and a minivan. So that was the, um, the standard dream. Um, and then reality hit. So it actually turns out that 40% of families are affected by rare disease. So it's, it's really not rare. Um, if you look at the numbers even closer, so the statistics say 1 in 10 people are affected, so then if you expand it to a family, like the grandparents, their kids, and their grandkids, that makes up a big enough group so that we can assume every single family will encounter this problem. And indeed, it has hit us as well. So. This is uh, my second daughter. Um, the pregnancy was uneventful, but then I went to a routine checkup at 37 weeks, which is full term, actually. Um, the heart rate of the baby was detected to be too fast. I was sent over to a special ultrasound where she was uh, found to be extremely small, and so they induced me the same day. Um, they thought maybe the baby has some growth difficulties inside the womb and maybe will be do better outside. So she was born extremely small, actually under two kilos, um, and ended up, not surprisingly, in the NICU for a few weeks. Um, mostly just really to establish feeding. She didn't have any obvious problems other than the size, so we were sent our, on our way. And, uh, I remember on our way home um, this feeling that something is just not right, um, parents' intuition or mother's intuition. For those of you who have kids, you might have experienced this. Um, my first daughter actually was born six weeks prematurely and had actually more obvious difficulties in the NICU. She spent four weeks in the NICU, but when we got to take home, it was kind of like a feeling of relief. We knew things are going to be cut and she's going to be fine. With my second daughter, that was not the feeling. We knew something was off, but we didn't know what. Um, and then sure enough, at four months, she became so anemic that she needed a blood transfusion urgently in the hospital. So the color on this picture is kind of off, but she actually looked kind of off. She was so pale, it's like a weird color if there's not enough red blood cells. So that's how our journey into rare disease began. So today's talk will, is divided into several parts. Um, first we'll talk about rare diseases in general, then specifically about the disease, disease that affects my family, um, and then talk about what to do with all this information. So what is a rare disease? Would anyone like to take it, a guess at the definition? A few people that affect it. Yeah, a disease that affects just a few people. That's right. And what's few, that actually again is up to debate. In the US, the definition is a disease that affects more, uh, less than 200,000 people. There are diseases that literally only affect a handful of people, and there are diseases that do affect tens or hundreds of thousands of people, so, and everything in between. Uh, our disease affects about 5,000 people worldwide, probably, so in, in, that, in that range. The definition in Europe is one in 2,000 patients. It's, it's a similar ballpark. So that's what's considered real disease. 
There are 7,000 different rare diseases out there. Three quarters of them are genetic in nature, and the others could be environmental, autoimmune diseases, even some infections. And combined, all these diseases and their population of people add to a lot of people. So estimated about 10% of the developed world, world's population, or 30 million people in the US, 30 million in Europe, or 300 million worldwide. So rare diseases are not rare. So who in this room knows anybody with a rare disease? Actually now, all of you do, right? Because my, my family is affected. But very likely you already knew somebody before you met me. It's just not always obvious. Some diseases are just not really obvious because it's some metabolic problem. On the other hand, um, a lot of the people who are affected are children. And Many of these diseases are so severe that um, kids don't live to five. So um, many of these genetic diseases are really, really serious. Um, and as I said, others may not be. Any questions so far just in general about rare diseases in general? All right, so um, we have I have a question. Could you uh, specifically say what diseases are rare? Like just a few examples. Just a couple? Yeah. Some examples? Okay, yeah. so um, she asked me to give some examples of other rare diseases. Um, so there are two diseases that are related to ours in different ways. So there's one called Fanconi anemia, for example. It's also a disease that affects the bone marrow um, and has about similar population size. Then there's cystic fibrosis that probably everybody heard about. And I think in Europe um, they call it mucoviscidosis uh, or some, something similar, but it's in cystic fibrosis. It's only about, I think, 30 to 50 times more common than ours, but the, they are. Um, patient advocacy organizations did a really fantastic job at advocating. So I think almost everybody heard about CF or cystic fibrosis somewhere. And they've been also very, very successfully developing treatments. You might have heard on the news recently that now there's really a combination of drugs that can significantly extend their lifespan and, and, and give a lot of quality back to their life, and it wasn't an easy task. Lots of different medications and pathways um, had to be targeted, but it was done, and it was done because the patients and the patient advocacy groups pushed, pushed and worked hard. Yes, another question? <coughs> yes, I have a question. A uh, uh, friend of the family, of my family had, their, their kid has cystic fibrosis, and when he was born, he was also born prematurely, and they had him in the ICU. I don't know if it was as prematurely as, as your, your child was, but uh, is that a common symptom of rare diseases? Pre, pre, premature pre birth? So the, the question is whether premature birth, birth is common with rare diseases. And I would say yes, absolutely, and probably, or certainly also stillbirth or miscarriages especially early miscarriages. So miscarriages are actually really common too. It's estimated that maybe a third of all pregnancies end in early miscarriage. And um, many of them are probably due to gen genetic defects. Maybe bigger kinds where maybe whole chromosomes are missing. Uh, but then throughout the pregnancies, um, definitely can be to miscarriage and premature birth. Yes? Just so uh, are there any organizational responses to, uh, uh, to rare diseases in general instead of just this and that that Yes, mm -hmm. yes, there are organizations that support rare disease as a whole. 
um, that is a big one in Europe. They are actually the ones who started the Rare Disease Day campaigns. Um, and in the US there is se several actually that support rare diseases as a whole. Each have slightly different, um, different focus. So uh, Global Genes, for example, focuses on empowering patients and patient support groups to do more and be more effective in their work. So um, if anybody would like to jumpstart something, that would be a good place to start. Yeah, my question would be that, uh, uh, maybe it's a little bit too personal, so please feel free to say no, but is there anything similar happened in your family before? Like, or it's just really from out of the blue and this is the very first case? So, so the question was whether um, anything similar has happened to my family before or was this a complete surprise? Um, it was a complete surprise and that's actually also um, very typical for genetic diseases because many of them are recessive, so to say, so the parents are just carriers of the trait without any symptoms. And then if two such parents come together and have kids, then a quarter of the kids would have the disease. Um, so, and our disease is really so rare, and because there are thousands of rare diseases, it's impossible to screen for all of them with the current technology. I mean, they do screen for many they now, including cystic fibrosis, and they screen for a couple of hundred, but ours was not on the list. So it's too rare. Mm -hmm. yes. As you speak about uh, the testing for diseases, it is known how many percent are of these uh, diseases monogenic? Monogenic? Um, so that you can uh, screen yeah. for a monogenic disease, but it's very difficult. Yeah, so, so the question is what percentage of these, this pool of thousands of rare diseases is due to a single gene versus many genes, like autism is assumed to be due to mutations in many different genes. I don't have that number, um, so I'm not sure, but it's, it's a great question. All right, so um, let's move on to the, uh, my family's rare disease challenge. It's called Schwachmann diamond syndrome. It, any of you have watched the short video I made for Rare Disease Day? It's not an easy name to pronounce, <coughs> but it is what it is. And it's named this because the doctors who first described it were Dr. Schwartman and Dr. Diamond here at Boston Children's Hospital, actually. I think in the 60s. Um, or, yeah, I think 60s. This is a genetic disorder and a single gene disorder. Um, most of the cases are due to a mutation in a gene that's called um, SBDS. Um, that's just the name of the gene. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disorder, which means that the parents, typically, the parents are carriers without any symptoms, and if two carriers come together, they have a 25% chance of having a child who has the disease, 50% chance of a carrier, and 25% chance of completely free of the genetic defect. So our first child is uh, not affected, our second child is. Um, this gene and its gene product, SBDS, um, is expressed in all tissues in the body and it's ubiquitous and essential. So if a cell or an organism is missing this protein, it's not compatible with life. So what this means for this disease population that mutations are there, but a little bit of the protein is still made. Otherwise, the patients wouldn't be alive. It's just not sufficient to do its job. So what is its job? Its job is actually um, to help assemble um, ribosomes. So, Anybody familiar with how cells work? A little bit? High school. Okay, so I can walk you through. So this represents a mammalian cell. Um, here's the nucleus and here's the DNA. You might, probably most of you are familiar with DNA um, 
what is the DNA for and what does it do? It encodes proteins, that's right. So um, all our bodies are doing relies on proteins. It could be structural proteins or um, enzymes that do some, some function in the cell. So we have many, many chromosomes which are um, in the form of DNA and then how is that, how that, does that result in proteins? So first the DNA is transcribed into RNA, so shorter sequences just specific for a particular gene. And then the gene leaves the nucleus and ribosomes attached to it and it's the ribosomes who then read what's on this messenger RNA and um, piece together sequences of amino acids and these long amino acids then fold up into tertiary structures and that's what the proteins are. So first we have DNA, the t DNA is read uh, and translated into shorter sequences of messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is then translated into protein sequences. And this translation is done by ribosomes. I usually think about ribosomes like little sewing machines. So it has a template and then it goes along the template and so makes a string of amino acids. So in schwachmann diamond syndrome, the uh, enzyme that's responsible for the ribosome to come together and attach to the messenger RNA, that's what's missing or dis dysfunctional. So typically the ribosome exists in two halves, a bigger and a smaller part, uh, and they just float around in the cell. And when it's time for them to do their work, they have to come together on the messenger RNA and build this bigger complex. So with the Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome, this uh, step of the two subunits to come together is disrupted. So the patients don't have enough working ribosomes. Okay, so that's the defect. And so you can see how if this if if no ribosomes could work at all, then that just that couldn't be a viable cell. But um, it's disrupted, and it's disrupted in all tissues, so the whole body uh, has problems. Any questions so far? I think that that's, I'm not going to go into any more detailed details. All with me still? So is a single, is a single gene um, responsible for a single protein, or any yes. single type of protein? Or? Yes, so each gene on the DNA yeah. encodes one protein. Yeah. In some cases, then the different proteins come together and make bigger complexes to do their job. Okay. But usually, yes, one gene, one protein. It's the same thing. So the whole body is affected. The severity of the symptoms vary. Um, my daughter's uh, symptoms are somewhere in the middle. So she had this problem with anemia, so very low red blood cells. But once she received her transfusion, her bone marrow kicked in and is working now fine for the red blood cells. Um, most patients have problems with their pancreas, where the pancreas is not making enough digestive enzymes, so they have to take supplemental enzymes, similar to cystic fibrosis patients. So with every meal, they have to take enzymes in order to be able to digest their food. Otherwise, they can't digest it or absorb any of the food. Um, so we have that problem. Um, some problems have some patients have problems with their bones. Um, could be like their rib cage cannot grow enough, and so their lungs cannot develop enough. Um, so it can lead to major lung problems because of that. Some have problems with their hips or knees. Um, some have cognitive, cognitive delays too, uh, but, but it is a spectrum. And that's probably because the dose of this SBDS gene varies from patient to patient, um, how much of it is actually there and working. Yes. You mentioned that uh, X does in every tissue. Yes. And 
then practically it affects every protein synthesis, not just mm -hmm. one to one number, but right. every protein synthesis. Yeah. And most of the proteins is in our skeletal uh, muscle and, and the body. Yeah. So there is a development, uh, it's a serious development, uh, like the, the whole body. So problem on average, the patients are smaller. So as a whole, they're smaller, but they're usually quite proportional. It could be that their legs are short, shorter, or there could be some more obvious um, bone deformities too. Um, my daughter, she looks completely proportional, just small. And there are patients also who have a milder phenotype who actually are normal size and, and are only diagnosed in adulthood because they function pretty well. So, yeah, so everything is affected, but to different degrees. And the, uh, the organs that are most severely affected are usually the pancreas and the bone marrow. And why that is, is not clear. Like, why the pancreas? There's a lot of tissues in the body that turn over quickly. We would expect that those, all those tissues should be strongly affected, but they're not. So, basically, uh, there is a level uh, when or how this gene is functioning. Is this level is constant through life? It can be better or it can be worse? As she oh, good question. So the question is whether um, this expression of the protein or the, the function of the protein changes throughout the life of a patient, whether the patient can get better over time. Um, yes and no. So it turns out the pancreas problem can get better over time. So, but for half the patients, their reliance on enzymes goes away after age five or so. But the uh, problems with the bone marrow don't improve. If anything, they are, they get worse. So it's, uh, again, it's not known why the pancreas in, in improves, um, but that's just its observation. And you mentioned the uh, digestive enzymes, but what about the insulin? Um, so the pancreas has, so the question was about um, insulin. So the pancreas has two functions, the endocrine and exocrine function. So the exocrine function is um, the production of digestive enzymes. So that's almost always affected in SDS patients. The other function, the insulin production, um, is not always affected. So it seems that patients are at increased risk of diabetes. Uh, cystic fibrosis type of diabetes, uh, but it's maybe estimated maybe 20 or 30 percent increase. Um, so it's not a given, but can be affected, like everything else too. And how about the immune response? Because those usually mm -hmm. need a very fast uh, protein uh, production. Uh, yeah, so the next question is how about the immune system? So. That's a great question. The immune system is very complex, and for some patients, it's strongly disrupted, and for others, it isn't. What is almost always uh, affected is the neutrophils. So the, um, the, the bone marrow is where our, our three um, blood cell lineages are made, the red cells, um, the red blood cells, the platelets, and the white blood cells. And um, so for my daughter, the red blood cells were affected when she was four months old, but had, since then, uh, we didn't have problems there. Um, but almost all SDS patients have problems with the neutrophils. That's one type of white blood cells responsible for clearing infections from the blood. So our patient community is at risk for sepsis. And, and that's, um, as a result, they, the kids have fever protocols in place. Meaning if they have any fever, we have to take them to the emergency room. They get blood drawn, blood culture. If they look like they could possibly have sepsis or bacterial infection, they are hooked up to IV and antibiotics right away. So, you know, it does affect the quality of life quite a bit because we want to reduce infections as much as we can, but still have to balance with quality of life as much as possible. Like sending um, my daughter to 
school was quite nerve-wracking in the beginning. So we didn't send her for the first three or four years, and then we slowly started to introduce her to school. And we did have to do a couple of um, emergency room trips with fevers. But luckily, it turned out that it was just some viral colds, so she did not need further treatment. But nevertheless, we do have to take her to the emergency room every time with a fever. And other parts of the immune system may or may not be affected. So my daughter, she seems to be doing fine with viruses in general. So if the kids bring a virus home, usually it hits me the hardest, and the kids are OK. Uh, luckily, even my, my sick daughter. Um, but other kids I know in the community are not are really having problems with viruses too, and they need um, IVIG infusion. So that's infusion of antibodies uh, to help them fight all sorts of infections. Yes. Is it known if it's actually the, the level of the protein or the function? which is effective? Um, the question was whether the mutations cause just the level of this protein to drop or it disrupts the function. But I know that um, the levels are definitely increased, uh, decreased um, in patients. But that could be secondary to a disruptive function. So sometimes if the protein doesn't fold right, the cells would clear it. And that's why the level would be low. Um, so that, that could very well be the case. Yeah, sorry, it's just the thought that, you know, you mentioned that uh, in your daughter specifically the neutrophils are very low. So I just um, kind of like know or heard about that that many times. So the immune system has multiple components and parts. And, and I can imagine that, you know, other cells kind of like trying to um, to, and yeah, and compensate to mm -hmm. the to the new neutrophils. So I don't know. Have you seen anything that maybe she has a higher lymphocytes or macrophage numbers? So it's, and maybe it's later on, it's, it's also you know helping yeah. with uh, dealing with different uh, infections. Yeah, it's possible that other parts compensate. I, I could absolutely imagine. Um, it's also. Um, it's also not as simple as just the level of the neutrophils because some of the patients have pretty good levels, but they don't work. So they have the neutrophils, but the neutrophils don't do their job. Um, there's a video um, on, on Google or YouTube that shows actually the neutrophils uh, going under a microscope. You can see them going and, and eating up by bacteria. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and for some patients, they're just not doing their job. And then in other patients, the level could be really low, but if they're activated, they're really activated and they really do their job. So again, it's a spectrum. Yes? Just out of curiosity, have you ever looked into gene therapy? Uh, yes, the question was about gene therapy. Right, so there's no... DNA editing techniques that we hear about CRISPR-Cas9. Yes. We'll, we'll check, we will touch on that. Oh, okay, good. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, the I think the original question was about the immune system. So, neutrophils are often affected and other parts of the immune system may or may not be affected. Um, so, it's the pancreas and the bone marrow that are mostly affected for in this disease. And um, this problem is the bone marrow has two opposite kinds of problems. So one is the um, failure of the bone marrow, which results in not enough neutrophils, that's one type of white blood cells, not enough red blood cells, or not enough platelets. Um, there's some ways of dealing with these problems, but it's not perfect. For neutropenia, there are drugs that can stimulate extra production, but um, it's debatable whether that actually might be uh, causing leukemia down the road. So, you know, it wouldn't just be given to a patient just because the counts are low. The patient would have to really ha have frequent infections um, to mandate that. Anemia, you can do blood transfusion, but 
you can do blood transfusion indefinitely. Um, iron accumulates in the body and does organ damage. So if a patient becomes dependent on red blood cell, uh, red blood transfusions, that's not good for the long run. So that would be a serious problem. Platelets can be transfused, but again, who, who wants to be in a hospital every week getting a transfusion of platelets? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it affects the quality of life. Or all of the cell lines could be affected. On the flip side, so that's all too few cells. You can also have the opposite problem of too many cells, which is blood cancer, leukemia. So our patients are at risk of developing leukemia. And, and that's, that is really serious because <coughs> it's very hard to treat. So MDS is considered a pre-leukemic change, it's called myeloid dysplastic syndrome, and AML is acute myeloid leukemia, one type of um, leukemia that comes up most often in, in our patient uh, population. And so to deal with both of these problems is a bone marrow transplant. Have, have you ever heard of how that's done or what it means to have a bone marrow transplant? Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's brutal. Um, but potentially can be curable. So it's considered curable for our patients for the bone marrow problems. It, wouldn't, it doesn't fix any of the other problems. If anything, it adds to the other problems because of the toxicity. So the challenge is, first of all, not everybody has a donor available for a transplant. My daughter does not, because um, um, she is mixed ethnicity, and we check the um, bone marrow database every year, and there's nobody who matches her. I have uh, friends in Boston who have kids with the same disease. They have literally thousands of matches in the registry. So, you know, it just, some patients have bad luck. They just don't have a match available. Then there's the toxicity. So a bone marrow transplant, when a bone marrow transplant is done, first the um, bone marrow, the original bone marrow of the patient has to be killed. And that's done with very strong chemotherapy. Um, with normal patients, they also usually do radiation and even stronger chemo, but our patient uh, population cannot survive that harsh treatment at all. So they are only candidates for low intensity treatment, which means that um, if the leukemia is an aggressive one, it cannot be stopped, it cannot be killed. Uh, yeah, the leukemia cannot be killed because the patient would be killed by the treatment. Um, then during transplant, once the patient's original marrow is killed, there's a high infection risk because the immune system is completely wiped out for several weeks at least. There's long-term damage from the chemo. Um, and then there's GVHD. So GVHD is graft versus host disease, and that happens when the uh, new cells that the patient receives attacks the patient's body. Um, can destroy the gut, the skin, many parts of the body. It's awful. Um, it, it, it is really bad. Um, the chances of this happening increases um, with matches with donors that are too different. So, if a patient has an identical twin as a donor, the risk of this GVHD is very low. If, um, if there is a mismatched donor, then the risk increases. And so the outcome of the transplant is also less good. Uh, the opposite of this problem is, is the graft failure, where the new cells that the patient receives just don't engraft, don't stick in the body. And it's quite, actually quite an interesting process that um, the transplant is actually just looks like a blood transfusion. So the, the bone marrow cells from the donor or the stem cells of the donor are just infused into the patient like a, a blood transfusion. 
and then the stem cells go and find their space, their places in the in the bone marrow. They settle in there and then start producing the other blood cells. So um, it's quite interesting. So our statistics is about one in three of our patient population population will develop MDS or leukemia uh, by age 30. So one, one in three by age 30. So life for me is like living with a ticking time bomb um, because we don't even have a match for my daughter. But even if we had a match, it's still such a difficult process to get a bone marrow transplant. I'm going to skip this. Um, are there any questions? What? What is? Oh, okay. um, try. So I'm going to skip most of this. Um, my website has some information about bone marrow transplant. So if any of you is interested in becoming a donor, there's a big uh, national donor database where you get typed and then if you match a patient, you will be called for further testing and can donate bone marrow for them, um, either um, through peripheral, or like a blood um, blood donation, or through aspiration from marrow from the hip bone. So, if there's questions about that, we can talk about it at the end. Actually, I have a question about this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The well, it, either way, so it's my, fine. my question is that like, you know, especially us who are originally from Europe, like giving blood is already a problematic question here in Massachusetts at least. We are also restricted to do bone marrow? No, so, so the question was, um, are the restrictions for donating bone marrow the same as for donating blood? Uh, and the answer is no. So yes, anyone who lived in Europe in the 80s, is it, or 90s? 90s. Yeah, 90s cannot donate blood here because of the medical. Yes, that does not apply to bone marrow donation. So, uh, but there's an age limit. So, um, Be the Match is the organization that uh, processes a lot of these um, samples. Just thanks them, or no, not thank. I shouldn't say that. Like registers, types the people, and put them in a big database, and they do it for free until age 44. Um, older people can participate <coughs> too, but they have to cover their costs, so to say, um, for, for just the typing. And then there's another organization called uh, DNSK, I think. Um, if anybody's interested, I will look it up for you. They do it for free until age 55. And is it available like in Boston? Like, I'm just yes. interested about you know, so how much you have to go So the actual process, it's very easy. Um, the process is you go to a website, request a kit. It, they sent you like two long Q-tips, you swap your cheek and send it back in the mail. And then they do the typing on that, enter you in a database, and if you match somebody right away or in the future, they'll call you to do further testing. So it's an easy process to get on the registry, um, but it's a commitment. So if they call you, it's because somebody's life depends on the donation. It, it is a big difference if you just need to donate blood or, or bone marrow directly from your yeah, somatic so how is that decided? Usually pediatric recipients usually need the actual marrow, uh, but 75% or so of donations are done via blood. It, it is a blood donation, but it's not just a blood draw. Um, the donor receives some injections to produce more stem cells, release more stem cells from the marrow. And then the donation is, um, uh, they draw blood from one side, run it through a machine, and then run the rest of the blood back on the other side. So it, it takes a couple of hours. So it's, it is a process, but it literally saves somebody's life. It's definitely worth thinking about it. Talked a little bit about matches. Um, yeah, so white people have a really good chance of finding a match and with different ethnicities. Um, the odds are worse and mixed is the worst category. 
What they're looking for with HMA matching are certain surface antigens on cells, and there's just such a big variation that's possible. So there are um, six kinds of receptors on the cell surface, and each of them can have hundreds of forms, some illustrated with colors. So each of those uh, markers could have a different color, it's one of hundreds of different colors. So the combinations that are possible is almost in infinite. Um, and black people has more availability, this is why no, less match? No, it's because they are smaller pool. Yeah. So smaller pool of the database. So, so it means like more white people have probably in the database, okay, right? Here. Yeah. yeah. But generally if you are in Africa well, yes, but it, I think yeah, this is just the only representing the database. It's the database, but it's in the international database too. Um, yeah, this particular graphic is for the US. Um, I tried to find some information about Hungary, how diverse the gene pool is there um, in relation to, to the HLA typing. I didn't find much information, so if somebody knows, please let me know. No, they're just more likely to find a match within their ethnic group. But I, I, I've seen um, lots of stories online where really people really don't look alike at all and they are perfect matches for each other. Black or white or Chinese or whatever. So now let's talk a little bit about hope. Um, Especially here in Boston and, and just in biotech in general, there's so, so much evolving and so much new technologies coming along. Um, I could spend a lot of time on all of them, but let's just focus on one, the, the CRISPR and gene therapy in general. So for a disease like ours and many, many others, especially single gene disorders, that is really a big hope and promise. And um, I would say the challenge is not so much fixing the gene sequence itself, but how do you deliver it to the body? That's, that's really the problem. Like if the whole body is affected or the brain is affected. Like how do you deliver those fixed cells into the right tissues? So um, that is a big challenge right now. Luckily for my disease, even though it's so nasty, with the bone marrow, that is actually an opportunity because you could take a patient's cell, cells from the bone marrow, fix the gene sequence, and then do a bone marrow transplant with those with the patient's own fixed cells and put it back. So that problem of delivering the right the fixed cells to the right tissue is possible for for our disease. Um, so it's a perfect model disease for gene therapy in that sense. It's a single gene, you can fix the gene, the sequence is known, um, the delivery is very possible, and the patients are very motivated. Um, the obstacles are that the patient population is small, so it might be a challenge to find, to know enough about the disease, like which patients are at the highest risk of developing leukemia. Which patients should be given gene therapy in the future? Um, we might not know exactly what markers to look for. Like when is the right time to do a transplant? Um, what to look for? Um, there is, it might be hard to find enough patients for a clinical trial uh, for, for all diseases that would, rare diseases that would be a challenge. Basically, these are the things uh, the organization I started is working on. So um, I'm looking to find enough patients to make this worthwhile. Um, I reached out to all my European counterparts. There are small groups in Europe, small support groups. I reached out to all of them to see if we can come together and find more patients. Um, I found a platform that would um, allow us to pull all patients together and integrate with existing studies for our disease. 
and pull in patient reported um, observations or, or problems too, so we can identify more targets and more challenges. Um, I read all the literature, obviously, and um, so we want to develop a research plan, like what are the biggest challenges, what are the lowest hanging fruits, what can be addressed now, what can be addressed in the future. Um, we want to find more patients simply by allowing more diagnosis. So currently, we were lucky, we were di my daughter was diagnosed at age one, so it only took one year to diagnosis, and that's considered fast actually. The average time for a rare disease patient to be correctly diagnosed is five to seven years, and I think the average of misdiagnosis along the way is like three, at least three or four wrong diagnoses along the way. So we were pretty lucky in that, but we can do better. So we need. I, it took switching three hospitals here in Boston area, which you would think is a pretty high standard, but still, um, it was hard to get the right diagnosis. So another project we want to do is find more uh, experts, um, build clinic networks where the doctors would be more knowledgeable, get, give easier access to diagnosis, uh, diagnostic tools, because um, that's not ev accessible everywhere easily either. Um, and yeah, so those are some of the projects we are working on. So I think we are out of time. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And what I would like to to ask you if you have more questions, please ask. But also if you know people who have an interest and deep pockets and the passion for causes like this, please connect them to me. Uh, we need money to make all the research and everything possible that we need to do. Um, and so just start it out, we need to build a network. Um, so thank you so much for coming and for your attention. Is it possible to test it before somebody wants to have children? Yeah, so now that we, so I suspect that as technology evolves and, and sequencing of this testing becomes cheaper, they will add more and more diseases to prenatal testing. Um, and for, for us, for me and my husband, now that we know, uh, we have options to either have more kids via IVF where the embryos can be tested before they transferred into the womb um, to make sure they don't have this disease. Or, you know, I guess that's the most uh, popular choice. Or, you know, so, so now we can test for it, but the odds are still the same. The reason I am asking, because I, I made one of those DNA tests uh, with the 23, Mm -hmm. And then it immediately picked up on my hereditary hemochromatosis, mm -hmm. which I actually knew that I had, but mm -hmm. without any kind of data, immediately showed mm -hmm. that I had that. So probably they would show it to somebody. Maybe. So I think the 23 and me, there's, you can pay extra to get the medical information yeah. too, and that's possible in the US, but not allowed in some other countries, for example. Um, but yeah, so it's, they, and they add more and more information about the diseases. So a few years ago, maybe it wouldn't have picked it up. And now they know which genes and which mutations are actually causing problems. And so now it would be reported, reported out to the patient. Any other questions? About your organization, so now you collected all this information. You have a um, site, I guess, where you have a website, yes. the, the patients and, and the, a lot of data on it. But then, how do you make somebody do this research? You will offer your own grants, or it's as oh, so how? How the question is, how are we are we going to enable and encourage more research? Yes. So there's different ways. So we can we can invest in. So there's a group at Boston Children's Hospital who is working now on CRISPR 
gene therapy for this disease. They started a program. So we could invest in that, but um, our pockets are not that deep, so we should use the money more strategically. So what I intend to do is um, bring together a big group of researchers, or any researcher who is at all interested in this disease, and brainstorm, come up with some pathways, like where are the gaps, what do we not know. We don't know why this defect in ribosome assembly causes leukemia. Like why? Why does this happen? It causes some kind of stress in the bone marrow, so there's probably some kind of pathways activated that render the DNA unstable in some ways. But we really, really don't know how that happens. So if we could um, provide seed funding to labs to look at those questions, and then those labs could go ahead and apply for bigger grants from the governments, that, that would be a worthwhile project too. And if we know the pathways, we might be able to find some drugs that work on it. So that's, that's the plan. The plan is to really figure out a research roadmap and strategically invest maybe smaller amounts of money to jumpstart um, projects that can go ahead can go ahead and apply for government funding. What is the website where uh, <laughs> the website is www.sdsalliance.org. Yes. Um, good point. That should be my closing slide. Invite I think. Yes, yeah, invite to this. Uh, invite to this lecture. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go right there, and I can show you where the uh, where the bone marrow information is. So that's the website. The video. It's an introductory video. Maybe some of you have seen it already. Um, there's information about the disease, information for patients and researchers. Well, another, um, another way we want to enable more research is to build a patient registry with more information, more data, <coughs> genomics information included, uh, and to develop and make research tools available to all researchers more easily, like tissue samples, develop maybe a mouse model or stem cell models, that kind of thing. So that's, that's also something we can do with less money than millions of dollars. Um, so the information about um, bone marrow transplant is would be here under how you can get involved. There's a link. So this is where you would um, request the, um, your big Q-tips to be typed. But you mentioned that the uh, kids need the uh, actual mom uh, and the stem cells. Yeah, and so the... Most of the donation is stem cells. I never heard that bone marrow is a... So, traditionally it used to be called bone marrow donation because it used to be all just extracted from the hip bone. Um, but what you get when you do that, extract from the hip bone, is stem cells. Yeah. And so there's different ways to get to those stem cells. One is directly from the marrow, and the other one is to activate the stem cells with medication injected, and then harvest them through peripheral blood. But it gives us the same kinds of cells that are needed to um, yes, but you said that to do the transplant. Yeah. Yes, most of the time. Yeah, I think it's. It's the amount of cells that are in the in the actual marrow, and maybe there is also more um, earlier stages of stem cells. Maybe a, maybe a different ratio of cells. So I don't know exactly what the reason is, but for kids, they seem to the doctors seem to prefer to get um, marrow. And all the, another source is cord blood too. Um, Cord blood from, from babies. Yeah. That has advantages and disadvantages. I think they, it engrafts slower, but there's less risk of uh, GBHD, I think. So it depends. It's a medical art, I suppose, what works best, or what the options are for a particular patient. Yes? So um, I think it's, it's a probably everybody is uh, thinking the same, but it is so amazing that uh, you're obviously very motivated in this. 
when you started uh, this nonprofit organization. But I also wanted to ask you about your personal, you know, job because we have heard at the very beginning in the introduction that you are also mm -hmm. working. Uh, for uh, biotech companies, so can you just a little bit uh, just say about that, that? <laughs> like, yeah, otherwise. So I came to the U.S. for graduate school, so I studied molecular biology. Um, and then um, my husband got a job here in Boston, I moved here, and I did not actually do bench work. Then after that, I worked uh, in sales, in business to business sales. And then I worked at Elsevier, which is a big scientific publisher, uh, for one of their software products. So it's a software to manage scientific literature for researchers and research institutes. Um, and in that function, I did also lots of marketing, sales, and training, that sort of work, uh, not bench work. And then later, uh, with my husband together, we started a biotech company, mostly devices to isolate cells, different types of cells from different tissues. So that's that's my other job. So thank you. Thank you so much.